Laura and Josh Enns live in a museum, a Mennonite farmhouse built in 1850, which is located smack dab in the middle of the University of Waterloo Tech Park. For the past four years, the young couple have called Brubaker House their home, living in modern accommodations on the second floor as they promote and manage the museum and its grounds. They're also working to update the narrative of the land to reflect its origins as territory belonging to the Indigenous peoples who first thrived here. A lot of people walk through the grounds here, are enjoying the park, and they think this is just a university building. They don't really give it a second thought. And then we open the door, and we're going out for a walk or whatever. And Whoa, you can live there. And you just kind of be like, yeah, that's that. we live there. We were in Europe when, when the position here opened up. We knew we wanted to do uh, something interesting. Um, and we were, we're both Mennonite, and we have a lot of connections with Mennonite culture in the region. We had been students at Conrad Grable University College, uh, which was running this uh, house here and in, the, in, the, in charge of hiring the new hosts. And uh, we had some ideas to create programming and kind of modernize a little bit of the history in the museum um, in recognition of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And as well as uh, the indigenous history and culture that we're learning more about. Often I've been struck when people visit the house for the first time that people from all different cultures seem to feel at home here immediately when they move in, there's just, or when they walk in. Um, there's just something about the house um, that connects people to a simpler time. Mennonite settlers started coming to this area in the early 1800s and Susanna Herb Brubaker, a widow, came to this area with her son John in 1816. They were part of a group of 31 others who traveled up um, in a train of Conestoga wagons. So it's hard to imagine, but they left much of their friends and family behind in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, packed up all their belongings in these wagons, and walked across country through, um, through fields, forests, and over streams to come to this area. It took a number of weeks. And then when they arrived here, Susanna Herb Brubaker eventually went back down to Pennsylvania, but John continued to live here and had a family. Um, and he and his wife Catherine purchased land eventually for their family, for their children. So um, they gave this plot, Lot 25, uh, to their son John E. Brubaker and as newlyweds John and his wife Magdalena moved here and built for themselves a small log cabin uh, where they lived while they cleared the land for agriculture and started gathering field stones of all different sizes which they used to construct this beautiful farmhouse which still stands today. So when you enter the Brubaker house, um, you come right into the kitchen, which was the heart of the home. Of course, at that time, um, all of their cooking would have been done over the fire, and they ate quite simply, often oatmeal porridge for breakfast, uh, meat and potatoes for lunch, which was the main meal, and uh, potato soup sometimes, again, for supper. This was a dough box used for baking bread, um, which Magdalena would have done a lot of. Um, and she would put her dough in here to mix it up. Um, she, it could hold about 12 loaves worth of bread. Um, and then they would close it up and wrap it in quilts or other blankets and put it by the fire overnight so that the dough could rise and they would bake it the next day. In this red storage bin here, um, they would store about 100 pounds of flour and sugar, which they would go through in about a week. Um, and this bin would just help to keep out mice or other unwanted critters. And the two china sets here on the center shelf um, actually belonged to the Brubaker family and were passed down through the family as part of women's dowries. 
This was the master bedroom of the Brubaker house where John and Magdalena would have slept along with the baby and any other small children who would have probably been on a trundle bed, uh, which we don't have today. This was the closest room to the fire and so the warmth would have helped to improve the chance of survival for the baby or any sm small children. This beautiful dresser here was likely made by John E. Brubaker himself um, and it recently came to the museum uh, from the estate of Catherine Summers down in Kansas who was a great granddaughter of the family. Um, and when the dresser came to us um, there were actually a bunch of essays in the drawer written by Pearl Brubaker who was a relative of the family. Um, and she actually died when she was quite young. So it was very special to have those and to um, learn about what she would have been reading and writing about in school when she was young. So this beautiful grandfather clock is actually the oldest artifact in the house. Um, and it was built in Switzerland and survived a boat ride across the Atlantic as well as a Conestoga wagon ride up to this area and amazingly it still works today. Um, so originally um, they would have traveled with just the works and the works would have hung on the wall and then later the wooden case was built for it. It's also a bit of a myth that Mennonites were the first farmers in this region. Indigenous peoples were already farming here for thousands of years and Mennonites benefited a lot from their kinship with the land um, and some of their traditional burning practices which helped to clear um, some areas already which would have been used for hunting for indigenous peoples and then also hunting and agriculture for Mennonites later on. We felt like it was our responsibility to incorporate some of that history um, and make it more visible here at the museum. One of the most interesting experiences that we've had here in terms of actual kind of living experiences is, so the basement, this is a semi-permeable floor, so it'll flood um, fairly regularly seasonally depending on the rain and the thaw. And we have a snow shovel and a large bristle brush and we kind of push the water from the, the room over there which has like a solid cement floor into this one with a semi-permeable floor and sometimes we try to push it all the way out the door. It's a fun thing you wouldn't have in a typical house where if you have flooding in your basement it's a big concern whereas uh, here I mean it's all stone um, and it, it will drain through this floor eventually. The fact that, that we do have live-in hosts here adds a kind of a homey feel to the tour. Um, it makes it less of a historical framed art piece. We do have pieces like that in the museum, um, but it, it gives it more of a, a real story and people ask, well, how do you interact with the museum and, and, and how is it living upstairs? Do you see ghosts? <laughs> kind of thing, right? Um, which, which really makes it a bit, uh, I guess, more amicable type of tour than you would get in a formal museum setting often. We haven't seen any ghosts, by the way, but we're still looking.